Oh yeah. Absolutely. All right, Chris. That's the test. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Don't worry. If he's looking really surprised, it's because he is surprised. <laughs> I want you to read um, Matthew chapter seven, verse twelve. Okay. Just verse twelve. Just verse twelve. Yeah. You, if you want to borrow my glasses, you're welcome. Oh, to. No. <laughs> you're good. I'm good. Awesome. I'm good. God is good. Matthew chapter seven, verse twelve. That's right. Therefore, whatever you want man to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Praise the Lord. God is good. Can we just celebrate Chris, everybody? God is good. You may be seated. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, say that again? Oh, yeah, God to keep you on your toes. Come on. God is good. All righty. And um, you see, the Bible says, whatsoever you want men to do to you, do it unto others. And there are times wherein there are things that have already been done to us that we haven't done to another. And I was standing over there and Alan brought me up here for the word. And as I was led, I was instructed to have somebody else be brought up by me for the word. And so thank you, Chris, uh, for not debating and for responding so quickly. Praise the Lord. God is good. I'm excited to be here and um, so good to see the Jackson family. Uh, you've been out of action for a little bit and we understand why, but we're glad that you're here. I just want you to know that you have chosen the right spot to sit, I mean, to sit today because there is a cloud of God's peace that is just right where you're at. And you will take with you not just peace in your heart, but there will be peace upon your face. So that the ones that behold you, who have been grieved as you have been, who have yet to find peace, will find peace. Because we are made in the image and in the likeness of God. And what did David tell us about the face of God? He says, we beheld him and we became radiant and our faces were not ashamed. You see, there are times when things happen to us that make us just so shameful. We don't even want people to know that we're believers. Because we're like, man, the same thing that I have already told people that doesn't happen to people of God. Well, what am I going to do? How am I going to save face? The Bible says when we behold him, our faces become radiant and the shame is taken away from us. So I want to encourage you. Just know that the Lord has for you today the radiance of his presence, the radiance of his glory. And those people who may have been feeling ashamed, who may have been feeling like they have more questions than answers around you, I see them around you. And the Lord says when they see you, they will see what you have seen and their burdens will be lifted in the mighty name of Jesus. You know, quite often, we don't get to choose the way God uses us. You understand what I mean? When you choose how God uses you, there's a name for it. It's called ambition. Many people are ambitious about the things of the kingdom. You know, guys, I can't celebrate you guys enough. You know, so I just want, I just want to, yes, let's just celebrate God and thank God for these guys. And I have a word for you also. There was a shout. You know, the Bible says, make unto the Lord a joyful noise. And um, if you were bothered by my joyful noise, I'm not sorry. You were supposed to be making yours too. Because the people around me, I'm sure you must have heard the way that I was screaming and shouting. I wasn't manifesting a demon. So just so we make it clear. I was making a joyful noise unto the Lord. You know, because we are so obsessed with people being under the influences of demonic spirits that we forget that demonic spirits themselves are trying to copy the Holy Spirit. You know, you find people sometimes when they're under demonic spirits, they start to act like they're drunk. But on the day of Pentecost, when the power of the Holy Spirit came and filled the room where they were in the upper room, from a distance, they looked like people who were drunk. People were like, yeah, this guy is, I mean, is it, isn't it too early in the day to be this drunk? 
They didn't even say, isn't it too early for people to start drinking? They said to be this drunk because those guys were already filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible compares being filled with the Holy Spirit with being drunk. That's why the word of God says, do not be drunk with wine wherein there is dissipation or excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you come under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you just begin to obey the word of God. The word of God says, make a joyful noise. I make a joyful noise. The word of God says, dance before the Lord. I dance before the Lord. The word of God tells me to lose myself in the presence of God. I lose myself in the presence of God because there is nothing my composure will get me when I'm in the presence of God where there is liberty. Praise the Lord. So I want to encourage you. I'm telling you, I used to go without teaching the rudiments of being in God's presence until the Holy Spirit cautioned me a little while ago. And he said to me, the things that you have become familiar with are not as common or as not, are not as commonly accepted or practiced as you would think. And that was when I thought to myself, you know what, maybe I need to encourage people to shout like I shout. Maybe I need to encourage people to go before their faces because all through scripture, you find the posture of prayer, including the posture of supplication. Supplication means a humbled prayer. What does that mean? To humble yourself before the Lord. And we see that even our Lord and Savior, Jesus, he bowed before his heavenly father. Not because he had to bow to himself because he is God, but because he was on a mission to model to us how to behave. He being our ultimate example had to do it too. Because you know, God is not unjust. I keep telling folks, God will not ask you and I to do what he himself hasn't done. Whenever I say that, people who haven't heard it before, they start to think, mm, I'm sure I can come up with something. Yeah, I had a wage at the other day for $2,000 and I still have my money. No one's won it. Because I didn't just say that. The Holy Spirit cautioned me one day because he noticed that I was being reluctant to do something that the Lord was telling me to do. And he said to me, he says, the Father does not ask you to do what himself has not done. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, that sounds good, but let's think about it. And I started to think about it. He says, forgive others as I have forgiven you. He says, love others as I have loved you. You think about it. What is it that the Lord is asking you to do? The Lord is telling you, men, make a covenant with your eyes that you may not behold iniquity. And the Bible says that the Lord is too holy to behold iniquity. God is not going to place on you a burden that himself has not carried. The Bible says Jesus was in every way tempted as we are tempted. So what is it that we have been asked to do that he himself has not done? So I want to encourage you folks, when God says a thing in his word, he says it for your benefit. Because he doesn't need you to do anything for him to be God. He is already God and he never changes. He's not about to ask for your help so that he can be a better God. No, he's already a good God and he can never be a better God because to be better means to be compared to another. And there is no other because the Bible says all things consist, all things exist in him. In him all things consist. And so whatever God is asking us to do, he's asking us to do for ourselves. And ultimately for his glory, because when we, when we conform to the stature of Christ, our lives naturally become glory nodes for the ultimate glory of God. And when I mean, what I mean by a glory node is you become uh, an, a, a, an individual instance of the totality of God's glory. And that is where we need to strive to be ultimately. So once again, I'm glad to be here and thankful to see John's grandmother and father here today. We really are happy to have you here. And John's dad is here too. And when the mom came in, let's, let's celebrate John's family, everybody. Praise God. And when John's mom came in today, she was like, oh, I see a bunch of kids. You guys may need some more help in the nursery. And so I'm not surprised that she's not in here. She's one of those people. She's going to hit the ground and help where needed. And so now you know where John got that from. Praise God. God is good. So... One of the things that I'm mostly excited about today, being here, is I know that we have come to a season wherein the Lord is making it even more apparent the difference between his children and the world. You know, we've been growing together. The wheat and the tears have been growing together for such a while that in a number of ways, we have all become the same. Because we pay taxes the same, we drive on the same side of the road, we drive cars that look the same, we take our children to the same school, 
And after a while, by the design of the God of this world, we have become almost oblivious to the uniqueness of who we are in Christ Jesus. Apart from the fact that we still, apart from the fact that we do a lot of things that the world does, some of us, because we used to be in the world, we haven't come to truly see what the new creation experience is about. The Lord has offered it to us and empowered us by his Holy Spirit through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to live the new creation life. But it's so difficult for this mind that has known the world and the things of the world for so long to adjust. The mind is quite a difficult beast to train sometimes, but guess what? It is a beast that needs to be trained nonetheless. And so God is making it more and more apparent in the times that we're in, the difference between his anointed ones and the world. Two things why that is happening, two reasons. God is making it apparent so that the ones who are supposed to be with us, who have yet to recognize who they are, may see the dichotomy between us and the world and suddenly come to their senses and say, no, I need to be like these ones, not like those ones. God said, Jesus speaking, he said, you are a house set upon a hill whose lights cannot be hidden. But for so long, we have been wallowing in the valley of medioc mediocrity and we have become lost in the crowd, echoing the consensus of opinion of men. The consensus of the opinions of men. And Jesus says, that's not what I intend for my church to be. He says, after having asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Who do they say that I am? And the disciples started talking about the consensus of opinion. They said, well, people say that you are a prophet. Some say that you're a teacher, obviously. They call you rabbi. Some even say that you are Elijah. Because prophecy says that Elijah would come. And when Elijah came as John the Baptist, they were blind to it. In fact, the disciples of Jesus, who were very close to Jesus, when Jesus was going to break it to them, that Elijah had already come as John the Baptist, he said to them, well, I don't know if you guys can handle this. He said, if you have the heart to receive it, I say to you, Elijah has already come and he was John. And so the people that said maybe he's Elijah were actually not on, they were actually not pagans, so to speak. They were of the lineage of Abraham. They were people who had read the prophecies of Micah. They were people who could recite the prophecies of Isaiah. They were people who can transcribe and in some cases have even transcribed the notes of Jeremiah. They knew what they were saying when they said, you know what, maybe this dude is, is Elijah. Why? Because they just did not want to accept that he was the Christ. But they, they kind of knew that he was someone important. I mean, you don't work those miracles. They said no one works such miracles unless God be with him. But he cannot be God. They're quite happy with saying God is with him, but they do not want to admit that he is God with them. You understand what I mean? They, oh yeah, that sounds like many of us on many days. But I tell you what, Jesus said, okay, I hear what you say. But who do you say that I am? That was when it dawned on Philip and Thomas that they have actually never really thought about it on their own. Because they can't be asked to have an opinion of theirs. I said Philip and Thomas in particular because they were, very, they were two disciples of Jesus that were most difficult. Matthew, as much as he was in the world, do you know that Matthew's job every day was to collect taxes? So he was in the corporate world of corruption. He dealt with corrupt people every single day. And yet, he did not struggle with the things that Jesus said. God even gifted Matthew with the gift of discernment. When you read the account of Matthew, there were times when Matthew was seeing in the realm of the spirit as clearly as he was seeing in the realm of the natural. Remember the story of the madman of the Gadarenes? Other people recorded that there was just one madman, but Matthew said there were two of them because what he was seeing, he was seeing a shadow of madness that represented the unbelief of Israel. But there were two of them, Philip and Thomas. 
Thomas's problem was because of his name. You know, his name means the twin, right? That's why they call him Thomas Didymus, which means the twin. And I have taught here in the past, maybe I need to teach around it again, it's been a while now, that many of us, we need to learn to see our different states and personalities in the 12 apostles. Because there was a reason why Jesus chose them. Because he chose them to model to the rest of us what the rest of the body would be like. And so if you don't know yet how to find yourself in those people, you need to learn about Matthew so you know how to comport yourself in the marketplace without being stained by the world, even when you are being asked to do the most difficult things. You need to learn how not to be like Philip when Philip was yet to be transformed late translated because Philip his name means the lover of horses and so Philip was always getting ahead in his mind he was a man who loved horses he loved races and so whenever Jesus was saying one thing he was already getting ahead and he never got it remember when Jesus was when he asked Jesus he was like okay 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 so what's the father and Jesus was like you're looking at him and was like come on I mean be serious now and you know why? Because he had gone ahead of himself to see a glorified Jesus. And what he was looking at didn't seem quite like it. We, we castigate him, we judge him, but there was a reason why he was the way he was. Thomas was like, no, I need to see the holes in his hands. Why? Because there is a part of you that believes without seeing, and there is a part of you that wants to see to believe. Every single one of us, we're a twin. There is the spirit man that just believes because it is an extension of the almighty God. And there is the carnal, mind, the carnal mind in each and every one of us that only will believe when its emotions are, are tickled. The carnal mind relies on the senses. But the spirit man just believes the word. And so there is that twin in every one of us. So when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? It exposed where they were. That up until that time, even they were running on the consensus of opinion in the way they dealt with the Lord Jesus. Think about it for a second. When we think about it sincerely and transparently before the Lord, many of us will realize how much we are like that. Many of us come to church just because other people say we go to church. Many of us read our Bibles because that's what everybody says. Everybody says, read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day if you want to grow. I tell you what, there's nothing wrong with reading your Bible because Michelle says so, but the Bible will begin to make more sense to you when you know by a personal revelation what those letters mean. When you only give an offering because Alan is hounding you, you know what's going to happen? You may receive some blessing, but let me tell you something. You you don't even have an idea just yet of what it means to obey what God is saying until you have a personal revelation about why you must give. Sometimes the only reason why people call other people is because Manuelita keeps calling them and they're like, maybe I need to pass it on. This lady keeps calling me. Maybe I need to call somebody else. And then they call Laura. And then she doesn't answer the phone and they're like, at least I tried. When you have yet to have a personal revelation, you can never truly operate at the frequency of Christ. At the same frequency, at the same thought level, at the same willingness level, at the same obedience level of Christ, if you have yet to have a personal revelation. And so when Jesus said to them, who do men say that I, the son of man, am, they said what everybody else was saying. It was Peter alone who said, you are Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus was like, okay. At least not all hope is lost. One out of 12, I'll take it. He says, flesh and blood have not revealed to you, but my father who is in heaven. I personally used to have a problem with that. 
when Jesus says flesh and blood did not reveal to you or has not revealed to you, the problem that I used to have with that, and some of you already know, because I've said it a few times in the past, was that I knew that Peter was Andrew's brother. And Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. And the Bible says very clearly that the day Jesus got baptized in the Jordan, the person who was standing next to John the Baptist was who? He was Andrew. And behind him was Peter. And so when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So Andrew and Peter, they knew that that was Jesus because Andrew turned around and said to Peter, we have found him. And they resigned from John's ministry without notice. The Bible says that very day, they left the ministry of John and followed Jesus. And so when people leave your ministry, don't feel bad. You don't know what they heard. You don't know what they saw. You just keep minding your business. I used to go to God and complain about people until one day God said to me, what is it to you? <laughs> Mary was sitting seemingly lazily at the feet of Jesus when Martha was trying to run the ministry of helps. Martha was busy. She was the one organizing the conference and Mary was sitting there. And when Martha complained to Jesus, she said to Jesus, Master, why would you allow such insolence? Why would you allow someone like this to bring this kind of culture into the house? She's not doing anything. And Jesus said to Martha, what is it to you? Mind your business. Because this one that looks like she's not doing much is actually doing that which is needed. Do you know that almost every time somebody was reported to Jesus, the person who reported them got a scolding? A woman was caught in adultery and many people dragged her to Jesus. And Jesus was like, okay, I see you people. But whichever of you or whoever amongst you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. I mean, if I was there, I would have said, Jesus is not about me, it's about her. <laughs> when they bring me to you, judge me. But today, it's about this lady. But the way Jesus did it was he started to write in the sand. I remember the words of a Bible scholar. He said when he saw that in the New Testament that Jesus was writing in the sand, he said the vision in my head was when God with his finger wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone. He said, I, I believe that was what Jesus was doing and each one of them was looking and they could see each and every one of their sins and the Bible says one by one, they dropped the stone. You know why? Because the stone started to become very heavy in their hands. It's called the weight of the law. And so, I don't even know why I'm saying that, but I guess that some of us need to recognize how to mind our business and stop reporting people to Jesus. Report yourself to Jesus. Even you have a little progress that you're still missing out on that you can make. But going back to the flesh and blood situation, I had an issue with it because I'm like, wait a minute, Jesus, these boys were with John and John was flesh and blood because we were told that he was born of Elizabeth and he was not conceived by the Holy Spirit in the way that Jesus was. Zachariah was his father. And so this flesh and blood was the one that revealed to them that you are the Lamb of God. And for a while I was like, what is going on here? Why did Jesus say he was not flesh and blood? And then the Holy Spirit took me. He said, look at it yourself. What did John say to Andrew? John said to Andrew that we have seen the Lamb of God. Andrew turned around and said to Peter, he says, we have seen the Savior of Israel. But what did Peter say to Jesus? Peter did not say you're the Lamb. He didn't say you're the Savior. He says, you are the anointed one. You are Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus says, upon this rock, before he said upon this rock, what did he say? He says, you are Peter. Up until that time, Jesus called him Simon. 
And once again, after that, Jesus still called him Simon when he backslided. Okay, so don't let us just get a little commendation from God. You know, that's what we do. You minister to somebody or you forgive somebody that you already swore that you will never forgive. And one day you forgave them. And since then, ain't nobody talked to you. You've been feeling like you are the Holy Ghost. Because finally, you have just done something that God said you should do. You want to change your name to Melchizedek. And you're like, hey, nobody talked to me. I'm now the king of righteousness. I just did what God said. I put $2 in the offering basket. Ain't nobody talked to me. Oh, Alan stepped on my foot. I didn't even feel offended because Jesus is happy is he who is not offended. We receive a little commendation from God and we let it get to our head and God is trying to get to your heart. How did I even get there? <laughs> Praise God. Antoine, don't hide. Come and sit here. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what he does. He likes to be in the corner there. I don't know, maybe there's something in that corner that you need to reveal to the rest of us. I'm just teasing, just missed you. I haven't seen you like in two weeks, so I wanted you to be close by. Praise God. Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And he says, you are Peter, son of Jonah. He didn't say that. He just says, you are Peter. Because what he wanted to do, because there was a time that he would call him and say the son of whom he was, just to, because Jesus wanted him to know that this idea of yours is coming from your ancestry. You know, there are times when Jesus will call people out to let them know that whatever was coming out of them was coming out of them because of their traditions. And he would say things, when you study the way Jesus spoke, he never wasted a word. You understand what I mean? And so when he calls somebody and then he calls their name or he calls them in a certain way, pay attention. Like I was telling you, when Peter did well, he called him Peter. He commended him. When Peter was given in to Satan, Jesus called him Simon. He called him out. If, you see, God's commendations are just for the moment. Paul said, there is a lot that I have gotten done in the kingdom for his sake. He said, but now I put them behind me. I live every day as though I have accomplished nothing. If we can think like that, imagine how much peace will be in the house of God. Because the reason why Cornida cannot talk to me is because I feel like, man, I've been winning souls since 1984. How dare you talk to me like that? But then if I put everything behind me like Paul did, every day that I wake up, I feel brand new before the Lord. I don't have any accomplishments that are making me proud. I am hungry and I want to go out there and do the work of an evangelist. But every now and again, we just want to stay in the past. Don't worry, there is something that the Holy Spirit is doing with us tonight. He is highlighting to us, in his own way, the ways by which we have become like the world. Because the world always wants to carry the baggage of their accomplishments because they believe in their works. But we, we do not believe in our works because the Bible says our works of righteousness are like filthy rags before him. We believe only in his grace. And when we have found that grace, by that grace, we do the works of him who has sent us. But Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. This is where the Catholics kind of got it wrong because they believed that the church was built on Peter and he was the first pope. But the reality of it is Jesus was not talking about the man. He was talking about the revelation. The rock of personal revelation is what Jesus is going to build his church on. If you will be part of the church that Jesus is building, you have to be one that has a personal relationship with the Lord through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to be able to deduce from the Lord directly for yourself what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. Because if we continue to rely on what somebody says, what people tell you should drive you to where you will hear what God wants to tell you. When John the Baptist said to Peter, when he said to Andrew, this is the Lamb of God, that drove him toward Jesus. And he said to Peter, we have seen the Savior of Israel. That drove Peter toward Jesus. And together both of them found Jesus. And Peter was able to tell what Jesus by his own spirit had whispered into his heart. And that was the very first time that anyone would put it together that this is the anointed one and the instance of the most heavenly anointing and he is the son of God. 
The only way by which we will not be like the world is if we would be like Peter when he was speaking by the unction of the Holy Spirit because that is the differentiator between us and the world. The reason why we need to not rely on just what people say is because what God revealed to them is only one part. And if you run with that part, you deprive the rest of the body of the part that he wants to reveal to you because we know in parts and we prophesy in parts and every one of us should be in the ministry of prophesying. Please, I did not say every one of us need to have the prophet title to our names. Or prophetess Manuelita. Living by titles is again a worldly thing to do. And Paul called it out. I believe it was Apostle Paul. He says, we are not like the rulers of the Gentiles who lord over them. He says, but we are helpers of your joy. The rulers of the Gentiles, they want you to know what their title is. I am Apostle, Lord of the Rings. Can you not see me? That's what happens in the world. People use ranking. Have you not seen that today when the news media, let me say it the right way. Have you not noticed today when the kings of the earth, that people call the elites, which is wrong because we are the elites. The Bible says you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a peculiar people. We are the elites, but they love everything that God has given to us so much that they want to take it from us. They call themselves the elite. You are not the elite because the Lord already told us that when the great day of the Lord comes, with all the billions that you have stolen and all the underground cities that you have built, you will be there crying like little children, begging for the mountains to fall on you. In the great day of the Lord. And when that great day of the Lord, we will be high-fiving each other in the clouds. So who is the elite here? Let me tell you something. <laughs> the Bible says in, on that great day of the Lord, which is called the D-Day, the day of the Lord, the kings of the earth and their associates, from the greatest to the least in their ranks. The Bible says they will make for themselves holes in the ground and in the caves of the earth. To hide from the wrath of the Lord because they know what they're doing. You understand what I mean? Well, I'm not talking about ignorant people who just do things foolishly like the ones who crucified Jesus. Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing because the people who crucified him didn't know what they were doing. They were under the influence of Satan. We were told later on that Satan was the one who crucified Jesus. The Bible says that if the king, of, if the God of this world had known, if the prince of this world had known, he would not have slain the Lord of glory. So who slain the Lord of glory? Satan did. And so God says, Father, forgive these ones. They carried the hammer, they threw the stones, they, they twisted the whip, they made the crown of thorns, but it, it's not them. We know who's really controlling them. You know when you think like Jesus thinks, that neighbor that you think is from hell will suddenly not bother you anymore? Because it's not that neighbor, it's the demons that are troubling them. And the demons are troubling them because they want to trouble you. You understand what I mean? Because those same demons have come to you. But when they came to you at 2 a.m., they found you by your window. You were like, oh, and they're like, oh, my goodness, this guy never rests. When are we going to get him? So they go to your neighbor so that at 4 p.m., while you're just taking an evening stroll, your neighbor cuts his grass and dumps it on your yard. Because they're like, we're going to get him somehow. If we can just get him in the flesh, we're good. Because the devil knows that if he catches you in the spirit, you look just like Jesus. And so that is the reason why the devil wants you to come out of the spirit and be in the flesh. Because when you are in the flesh, they can mess you up. Why? Because in the flesh, you have no weapons. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that is the reason why the devil wants you to come out in the flesh and be angry. And be frustrated. And be emotional. Because the moment you start treading in that particular dimension, you are in Satan's territory. And then you see demons, they be tap dancing around you just to annoy you some more. And that is the reason why you cannot afford. So when the Bible says walk in the spirit so that you do not fulfill the laws, the lust of the flesh, it's not because God wants you to not enjoy life. Because some of us would think about God as this father that doesn't want me to enjoy. 
Oh, I can't drink a little alcohol. God, what is that to you? And God is like, yeah, because the moment you come under that influence, they can take you to places where you don't want to go. The Lord is doing a great thing upon the earth. He is making it more apparent that his children are different from the world. When the disciples were sounding like the world, Jesus showed them how not to sound like the world. Don't repeat what they are saying. When they say there's a casting down, you say there's a lifting up. When the world is saying that the economy is going down and that they're going to lose everything, you will say, well, I am about to gain everything because the Lord is my portion in the land of the living. We are not supposed to continue to be as the world we once were, but it's time for us to stop being double-minded. It's time for us to stop being Thomases. It's time for us to be decisive with the single eye on the word of God. Jesus says, let your eye be single and your entire body will be full of light. I was telling you just now about when the kings of the earth, the so-called elite, when they want to pass a message across and they're using the media to do it. One of the things that they do is they begin to show you images they use words that sensitize your emotions. And that is the reason why there's a lot of bad news in the news. Because there is something about bad news that gets you emotionally fired up. Because bad news is a remote control for fear. And fear is the portal for hell. So when people hear bad news, guess what happens? They become afraid. And once you allow fear to come in, fear is literally a portal that allows all of hell to squeeze through. Because fear is the opposite of faith. All of heaven comes down to your heart. How? By faith. The Bible says, by grace have we been saved through faith. We're saved by grace through faith. When you have faith, everything in heaven comes down to your heart. The righteousness, the peace, and the joy. In the same way, when you have fear, guess what happens? Everything on the other side of the curtain from hell can come in. And that is the reason why we cannot be like the world that panders to fear because we are hoping to receive our livelihood and sustenance from heaven. So we need to always speak the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing itself comes by the word of God. God is making it very clear that we are not like the world and we need to side with him and choose to divorce ourselves from the things of the world. It is a great thing to have been, or to be alive at this time, wherein God himself is making it clear that we are not like the world. I say that and I sound like I am repeating myself, but there's a reason why I'm saying that again and again. Because whenever God comes to make a separation between the wheat and the tears. He does it by the ministry of his angels. And the way they operate is such that they are no respecters of persons. When you see the angels of God, when they operate in scripture, they don't ask for people's names and ask where they want to be. Wherever you are, that's it. Remember the angel of death. The Bible says the angel of death, the angel of the Lord. You know, many times we, don't, we try not to think about the angel of death as an angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, that angel of death is called the angel of the Lord. He came to deliver the judgment of heaven. You understand what I mean? And when he came, God already warned them. This angel is not about to look at your faces the angel is not about to say, well, Antoine, uh, we know that a couple of years ago you were serious with the Lord, but you know, lately things have been a little slack, but we'll, we'll let it slide. You can still come in. No, that is none of their business. Their business is to execute the judgment of God as is. The day they come, whatever they find, that's it. So when the angels of the Lord come, that Jesus calls the reapers. We saw the description of the reapers in Joel chapter 2. And it's not pretty. The Bible says that they're an army of a huge stature individually and the weapons of man do not have any effect on them. So when they come 
to destroy the wicked in the face of the righteous because the Bible says, with your eyes, you will behold the reward of the wicked. So one of the reasons why you need to be confident in God, one of the reasons why you need to be bold is while we're here, before we are caught up to meet with him in the skies, our eyes will behold some pretty terrible things. I am not doing you a favor. Nobody does you a favor by telling you, oh, don't think about those things. Before it happens, you will be gone. The next time they say that, ask them, where in your Bible did you see that we will not see the reward of the wicked? When Jesus told the parable of the, of the tares and the wheat, what did he say? Many of us, we wished that Jesus had said the wheat will be taken from the field first, right? So that they don't have to behold the burning away of the tears. No, Jesus says, first the reapers will come and gather together the tears and burn them. And then they will gather the wheat into the barn. Now, I say this because of the fact that when God was mixing the church, when God was composing the church, he looked at three men that had been very pleasing to him in the past. And you remember those three men? Daniel, Noah, and Job. God was very pleased with the righteousness of those three men because those three men were a kind of trinity of righteousness. And so when he was mixing the church, he included the righteousness of those three people in the recipe of the righteousness of the saints. And that is the reason why every single one of us need to learn about those three men because their righteousness is the kind of righteousness that we carry. When the Bible says we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, it includes the righteousness of those three people. In a nutshell, look at what their names mean. Noah means rest. A lot of the times that we have strayed away from righteousness is because we chose to worry instead of rest. A lot of times, most times when you have told a lie or taken that which is not yours, what happened was because you couldn't wait for God to deliver. You couldn't rest in him. You decided to help yourself. I said, you know what, God? I know you're going to bless me later, but I'm just going to inflate my taxes for now. And then when I get the refund, I'll pay tax, I'll pay tithe, and we're going, to be, we're going to be good, right, God? And God is like, I don't need your help. I can bless you, and I have given to you everything that pertains to life and godliness. You just need to focus on growing because the more you grow, the more you receive what is yours. God says, I have given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. I've got a nice, beautiful Mercedes for you, but you're only 12 years old. You can't even drive it just yet. Keep growing and all the blessings will come because the Bible lets us know the way God dispenses blessings. He makes everything beautiful in its time. When it's time for you to get that house, he will bring it. God wants nothing more than for you to receive all the things he's created. Whenever he's walking the streets of gold, he sees all the stuff that he has for hand to hand and the storage is, is full and overflowing and God is like, can these people just come get their stuff? When are they going to get their stuff? He doesn't want to keep blessings from you. He wants to give it to you, but he doesn't want to give it to you when you cannot handle it. I love my wife, Rosemary, but I'm glad God did not give her to me when I was 14. Because we would have driven each other around the bend and mad. Because when she was 14, when I hear her stories and the things her siblings say, how fierce she was at 14, I'm like, oh, she would have killed me. <laughs> and when she hears my siblings talk about how spoiled I was at 14, I was essentially a brat. At 14, I didn't want anyone to take me to school anymore. I just didn't like the drivers driving. And so I started driving myself to school. At 14, and you couldn't tell me not to. When my mother tried to tell me to consider maybe going with the driver, I was like, uh, no. You see what I mean? And if my wife had met me then, oh, she would have just said, Lord, I rebuke this one. You understand what I mean? So what does God do? God waits until we have grown and then we get, the Bible makes it very clear that an offspring while they are still children do not differ from servants. No inheritance shall be given to them. But when they are grown and they have become sons, then they can receive the inheritance because they know what to do with it. 
So God is making a distinction and he says that I need my children to be bold and to be courageous because I am done babying them. I need them to be strong for me because all the things that I've said, I am going to carry out within a short period of time. And so imagine what's going to happen if you don't know these things ahead of time and God begins to remove wicked politicians and God begins to remove wicked businessmen and God begins to remove wicked industries from the earth. Some Christians will begin to sympathize with the world and they will begin to pray for the world against the will of God. And the Bible says a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. So what God is doing is God is raising his children to be warriors so that when he, the man of war, begins to move, they will not fight him. These are some of the things that the Holy Spirit has been showing to me very critically. On Tuesday, I was going to get away with it. He says, no. He said, you need to tell them about Jeremiah chapter 7. When he says the same mountains that have been full of royalties where is about to become a heap of flesh. Because many will be slain and their bodies will become food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I want you to begin to affirm to yourself or continue to because we made some affirmations on Tuesday. But you need to begin to say to yourself that regardless of what plagues that man under the influence of Satan is engineering to bring to the world to result in the death of many and the demise of many more that you will not have a part in that business. The Bible says that the disease of the world would not come near you. Only with your eyes will you behold the reward of the wicked. Don't be afraid what anybody is putting in the water for their own profiting. Don't be afraid of what people might be spraying in the air for their own pleasure. I want you to know one thing that when God said to you that if you by any means eat poison, it will not hurt you. Many of us are so afraid today to even pick up things from the shelves and the store because of all the chemicals, because of all of what they say. If you have been led to pick it, pick it without asking questions. Because your body is not like their body. Your stomach is not like their stomach. Because if you continue to see yourself as one of the people in the world, you will be swept away with them. I want you to look at yourself in the mirror every day and say to yourself, I, I ain't like them. I am not like them. I may be in this world, but I am not of this world. You know that we need to start to believe it. You know why? Michelle. You're a born again believer, you're a child of God. But two years ago, three years ago, your neighbor had a flu who is not saved and you had a flu too. And because we have suffered similar things to the world, we have somehow convinced ourselves that we're not really that different. But that is very different to what God's word says. The Bible says that you are a peculiar people. And so it's time for you to tell the other voice in your Thomas. To sit down and believe even without having seen. You know that Thomas had the ability by God to have said to himself, whichever voice is this that is telling me that I can't believe in the resurrection until I've seen the whole, I shut you off in the mighty name of Jesus. The Bible says it doesn't matter whose voice it is. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. I silence every voice that keeps reminding me that I am a man like anybody else. And I allow the voice that says that I am the new creation of God in Christ Jesus. Because the new creation of God in Christ Jesus is the one that all the blessings were promised to. The blessing of health was not promised to the whole creation. It was promised to the new creation. And the Bible says once the new creation believes it enough and receives it, even the old creation can enjoy it. Third John 2. John says, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. And so the fact that my flesh has not yet prospered doesn't mean that I should now say that my soul has not been blessed. No, I am the new creation of God in Christ Jesus. By his stripes, I was healed. The Moses that is on the inside never catches a flu. The Moses that is on the inside never gets a headache. The Moses that is on the inside is strong. As Moses was strong when he was 120 years old, my spirit does not use glasses. Because the Bible says when Moses was 120 years old, his eyes were not dim. And so if that is who I am on the inside, have I not been set free? And so if I am free on the inside, I just need to believe it enough to become free on the outside. Your body will be in health as your soul prospers. Third John 2. If I am dancing before the Lord in my spirit, 
And my flesh is saying, oh, I'm tired. Do I listen to the flesh? Or do I continue to enjoy the privilege that I have in the spirit? The more I stay in the spirit, the more chances my flesh has to enjoy an overflow of the anointing. Romans chapter 8 verse 11, the Bible says that if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, let me explain this because I know there are theologians amongst us. The way the Greeks wrote when they were translating the Bible, there are certain things that were lost. The Bible says if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will raise Jesus from the dead. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 will quicken your mortal body by his Holy Spirit. That is true, but that is not the whole picture. You see, because many of us, we're always thinking about the Holy Spirit being in us, right? The Bible says, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, but do you know that that expression dwells in you is also the same expression if you dwell in him? Because Jesus made it clear on multiple occasions. He says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall say, you will have authority. Jesus said in John chapter 11 verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. If any man be in me, he didn't say if I be in any man. He said, if any man be in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The reason why many of us are not enjoying in our flesh the resurrection power is because we're only thinking about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We're not thinking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is one thing, but for you to be in the Holy Spirit is another, and you need both for you to be in health. Can I say that again? I know you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you. And you keep quoting Romans 8, 11, And you're like, why is my body still the way it is? Why do I have arthritis? Why do I have all these pains in my joints? And you're trying to shake up the beast into the fire because you're only confessing half the promise. Jesus said, if you are in me, I am the resurrection and the life. So what do I need to do? I need to thank God that the Holy Spirit is in me, but I also need to make sure that I am in the Holy Spirit. Because when I am in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is in me, I will say to this mountain, be cast into the sea. I will say to the mulberry bush, be planted in the sea. I will say to sin, stop at the door. There is no room for you in the inn. If I am in him and he is in me, even my body will enjoy it. If the Holy Spirit is in you, thank God, and that's why you're temperate. That's why you bear the fruits of the Spirit. That's why you exercise self-control. But your body is still suffering. That's because you haven't dove into the Holy Spirit. You need to dive into the Holy Spirit. Hand, foot, Hair, everything has to be in the Holy Spirit. And the question on someone's mind is, Brother Moses, how do I get into this Holy Spirit? I told you the answer two weeks ago. I'm just going to remind you. Do you want to tell us what's the answer? Oh, come on now. That's it. Praise. Oh, yeah, that's the answer. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. The Bible says in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, Pleasures forevermore. Joy is the code, is the key word. When the Holy Spirit is present, there is joy. Because we have not received a kingdom that is in meat, that is in drink, but, is in, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so when you have the joy of the Lord all the time, and you continue to maintain the ambience of his presence, then the presence of the Holy Spirit of God continues to distill around you, and it precipitates into glory until it becomes so tangible that even your physical body cannot resist the resurrection power. You know that many of us, the reason why God did not heal us the first time we called out for healing is because he knows that if he gave you that healing, you will miss the rest of the blessing. Oh, yes. I told you the story once before of how we invited a foreign national to a party we were hosting in Nigeria in 1987. I will never forget. And this foreign national, because he was looking to get government contracts, he was very generous. 
If you said hello to him, he'll give you money. If you so much as look in his direction, he will ask you what you need. And so we invited him to this party and he had been told that in the culture of our people, whenever there's a party, you don't typically buy presents for people because you don't know what they need. Our people can be very secretive. They don't always tell you what they need. And so instead of guessing or relying on discernment, just give them money because the Bible says money answers all things. Alrighty. So it is more of our custom to give money to people than to buy presents for them. And so what we do so when you see us having parties and we go out, you know, and we're spraying people money, that same $50 that I changed into $1 bills is what someone who is none of the culture will put on the Target gift card. You see what I mean? But our people, that is not the culture. The culture is, I need to spray this money for everybody to see. Right? Not as a way of showing up. It looks like that. But it's a way of letting everybody know that you are loved and that you're honored and people will be there for you when you're doing something. And so we all come out and we keep spraying this money and everybody does that. And that's it. Nobody takes any gifts home, just money. Okay? So this man knew about the culture. So he came and because he was out to impress, he was spending the equivalent of $50 bills when everybody else was spending a dollar. 1987, I was but a little child. Money just looks like money, especially at an evening party. And so I had been there to dance a couple of times and people had given me $1 bills. Some people would spray me two times, three times. And sometimes I would crawl under people and pick the money, they sprayed them, it's free game. And then I had, you know, I had a total of about maybe $17, or 17 notes and I was feeling cool with myself. And then this man came out and he started spraying people money. And I went to where he was and I was dancing. And then he put the 50 note, the $50 note equivalent on my face. It felt different. <laughs> you see, that's why Jesus says you cannot serve God and mammon. Sometimes money can feel like God's presence. <laughs> you know, John, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you've been feeling bad, you know some days we just wake up and we don't feel good. You see, and then the Holy Spirit comes on you because you read the book of Proverbs and one scripture spoke to you and suddenly you feel fired up, you get out of bed, you're ready to take the day. It's almost no different when you wake up feeling bad and you get a text message that someone just transferred some money to you by Zell. You see what I mean? Especially when it's unexpected money. Suddenly you feel filled with the Holy Ghost, excited, good to go. Why is that? Because Satan wants money to take the place of God in our lives. So Satan packages money in such a way that money looks like God. When you're in need and you have money, money can meet your needs. But who really meets your needs? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that provides for you. When you're feeling bad, who is the lifter of your mood? The Bible says the Lord is the glory and the lifter of your head. But you sit there and sell $5,000 to Chris right now and that frown will disappear. You see, he just smiled, just the thought of it. Just the thought of it, the, the dude started to smile. And so I, I could feel it. It was almost as if someone anointed laid hands on me. I felt that note was different. So I peeled it off my face. And the moment I saw that it was a 50, that was it, it was over. I ran before he could change his mind. Something within me kept telling me, oh, this was a mistake. Before this guy changes his mind, nobody spends 50s like that. So he must have made a mistake. So in my own opinion, I was feeling smart. I ran off to one corner. I didn't even come out to where anyone could see me for like good 30 minutes. And so when I came out, I saw my brother and he had the biggest smile he's ever had. I looked at him. I was like, what's going on? He said, do you want to see what I've got? I said, yeah, I should have said no because I was happy up until I saw what he got, which is how we are, most of us, you know, you're happy with what God's done for you until, what you, until you see what God did for Rosemary. And you're like, God, what's going on here? Why don't you bless me like that? You see, your time is coming. And so when I saw what he's got, he had about eight of those $50 bills. And I'm like, where did you get them? He said, he was the foreigner. He gave you eight. He said, yes. He said, I just stood there like I was dead. And the man just kept giving it to me. He kept giving it to me. And I realized that I shortchanged myself because I ran from the presence of the man. 
That was what Solomon said. He said in, in, the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, I believe, he says, do not hurry from the presence of the king. Why stand you in an evil place? Many of us will pray for five minutes and we feel the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the tingling sensations and you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm ready to take on the day. And the Lord is saying, stop shortchanging yourself. Loose yourself in my presence. The Holy Spirit is the healer because he is the spirit of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the revelator because he's the spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus says he will reveal to you all things. He will reveal to you the heart of the Father. The mind of the Father for you is that you will be in health and prosper and so your body is waiting to receive the full revelation but you go into God's presence and after two minutes you think you've had enough and you've left and so the reason why God does not give you that one fifty dollar note is because he knows the moment he gives it to you you will run crazy and run out of his presence that is the reason why he keeps you continuing to come it keeps you coming back with just the little pennies the little dollars because it's like this little blessings will keep him coming until he learns that he needs to just stay here and never leave David says one thing have I desired and that will I seek after that I may dwell he never said that I may visit when he was younger what did he say he said oh I was glad when they said let us go into the house of the Lord when he was younger he was always glad to visit the house of the Lord but when he grew older he was not visiting anymore he says this is what I have now discovered that I may do well in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Let me tell you something. When we come here, sometimes they haven't even started singing. And you see me on my knees, on my face. And that is because I spend time in God's presence to the point wherein I just know how to press into that presence. Whatever you practice long enough, you get better at. And I tell you what, coming to the house of God is like going to a party when you were younger. It's better you drink a little bit before you go. So when you get there, you're already excited and overly excited sovereign and coming into the presence of God should not be any different be filled with the Holy Spirit before you come in here so that even before they sing you're already singing with the angels the presence of God is the key but I tell you what I'm going to wrap up on this note we're going to read Jeremiah chapter 7 this time around we're going to read verse 26 Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 26 and if Alan can help us or somebody else with a communion we're going to break bread and then we're going to pray today we are going to pray by the grace of God for healing. Before we do that, thank you, Jesus. The Lord just said to me that deliverances are taking place in here. There are certain strongholds that have held us back from receiving the fullness of what God has for us. And God is performing a surgery in here through the instrumentation of his presence. Many of us have been delivered from strongholds and mentalities that keep us in the old self rather than in the new self. You have heard the word of God today. And I'm going to summarize very quickly the three things that I have mostly said today as we break bread. But here is the deal. Before we summarize, if you have a testimony from the last couple of prayer meetings wherein we have prayed for healing... If you haven't shared your testimony, I would give you an opportunity. Maybe one or two people just come out real quick. If you haven't shared yours, especially if it's a testimony of healing, I would give you an opportunity to come up um, just as soon as we're done taking the communion. But before that time, we're going to read this Jeremiah 7 verse 26. I'm going to recap and we're going to break bread. 726, Jeremiah. So um, in case... You're watching online and you've never been to any one of our meetings and you're saying, every time I watch their videos, they're always reading from Jeremiah. You're welcome. Because there were certain prophets who lived before now who lived today. Okay? Several prophets who lived before now, thank you, who actually lived today. And I've broken it down some to us. The way that I've explained it to us in the past is using the story of Onesiphorus. Okay? And on the day, somebody was saying, Onesimus, you're not too wrong. There are two different people in the ministry of Paul. One is Onesimus and the other one is Onesiphorus. Onesimus means the profitable one. Onesiphorus means the one that is guaranteed to be profitable. So both of them, that's why their name sounds familiar. Their name's got to do with profiting. 
But the ones that have been guaranteed to be, to be profitable represent the generation upon whom the end of the ages will come. And the thing that was commendable about Onesiphorus was that he paid attention to the things that Paul said while he was in prison. And by so doing, God gave us a revelation of the prophecies that are very, very peculiar to our generation. The people who mostly prophesied about our generation were people who suffered isolation and imprisonment at some point in their lives. Paul was isolated, and if you look at the prophecies that he gave while he was in, prophecy, in, in prison, there were prophecies about the last days. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. He kept talking about the church in the last days, and when, when, when we're gonna be caught up to meet with him, how we need to comport ourselves you know, when the day of the Lord comes close. Jeremiah is one of those people too. Jeremiah was a very radical prophet that was given the grace by God to prophesy against the political situation of his time. It is not a grace given to everybody. Some people need to mind their business. Elijah had no business prophesying and getting into politics. And that was why, uh, what's her name? Jezebel wanted to kill him. She couldn't get him the first time. When he came back as John the Baptist, he was doing fine until he started prophesying against Herod. And Herod was a type of Ahab. And that was the reason why Herod's wife, who was a type of Jezebel, ended up doing what? In fact, she was Jezebel. The way John the Baptist was Elijah returned, she was Jezebel returned. And eventually she got the head of Elijah because she said, I want the head of John the Baptist. There was no reason for the head of John the Baptist, but because he got into politics. Now, Jeremiah, on the other hand, he had that grace the worst they could do to him was put him in prison. And then he would come out and he would keep saying the same thing. You understand what I mean? And so we read from Jeremiah a lot because he prophesied about the church. Look at what the Bible says in verse 26. The Bible says, yet they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. This is the word of the Lord to the church. By the grace of God, God's allowed for me, even after preaching these messages and teaching about Christian ethics and spiritual maturity, to also touch on the prophetic word for the day. The Lord is saying from heaven, I am showing the signs in the heavens. People are seeing or hearing of the earthquakes. We are singing the stars of heaven fall to the earth. We have had more comets, as they call them, or falling stars this year than we've seen in a long time, or maybe even in our lifetime. All of these things that have been promised are happening, and the Lord is saying, but the people are not turning to me. They have remained a stiff-necked people. Let me tell you something. Today, I am not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about believers. I'm talking about the people who are the children of God who are still continuing to be like the world. We're still talking like the world. We still put our hope in the things that the world puts their hope in. Many of us still believe that it's going to be well with, well with this world if only we can just vote right and elect the right people. But the Bible says that the arm of flesh shall fail. You cannot elect the right people to solve problems that have been perpetrated by Satan because Satan doesn't listen to politicians. The kingdom of darkness only respects one authority and that is the authority of Christ because the Bible says he is the head of all principalities and powers. And as long as we continue to put our hopes in people, we set them up to fail and we set ourselves up to fail as well. But if we put our hope in God, then God will choose the people that can get it done. If he wants people to get it done. But guess what? We have been wrapped into this worldly way of thinking. And the Lord is saying, I am making such a clear distinction between my people and the world, between the wheat and the tears, but some people are not letting me lift their neck because they're stiff naked people. They still want to blend into the world and, be, and continue to confess and profess from the consensus of opinion rather than speaking by revelation. And you're only gonna speak by revelation if you are in sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit only talks to the people who are listening to him. Because the Bible says, 
that when Jesus came, that when Jesus was to come, the prophecy was this, that a bruised reed, he will not break. A smoothering flask, he will not quench. You know, if someone has a smoothering flask next to you, some, what, how, what would you liken that to? Like a match stick that is about to be burnt out. If you blow a little wind against the match stick, what's gonna happen? The flame is gonna go out. The Bible says when Jesus comes, even if you have a smoldering match t- stick or flask, his presence will be so gentle that it will not blow it out. A reed, like a broomstick that is already half broken, the Bible says it will not completely break because it will move so gently and stealthily until he has brought justice to victory. And that is the way the Holy Spirit operates as well. So what am I telling you folks? God is already doing everything that he said he will do, but most people are not in compliance with the Holy Spirit and it's not gonna force you to turn your neck. It's not gonna force you to be lifted. He will bring you light, but you have to rise. And God is saying, if you would rise today, I will lift you high because I am doing a work upon the earth, which is the work of distinction. And you know why God is doing that? Let me explain this to you very quickly. I know that our time is fast spent, but we need to hear this. God knows that those four angels that will bring the final destruction that will wrap up this world system are not very friendly. He made them. And when he made them, he didn't give them the ability to make distinctions. General distinctions. There's only one thing they were told to keep away from. Remember the angel of death. The angel of death was told to keep away from what? The blood. When you see the blood, pass. The four angels who are in the four corners of the earth, we like to call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We call them all kinds of names. But they are the same four angels and they hold the wind of destruction that will bring the end of all things. And God sent a message to them. Can we, can we have, um, what's his name, Alan? Can we have Bennett or Emmanuel on the keys? When he, God sent a message to them. He said, go and tell those boys, all four of them, not to release the wind of destruction until they receive confirmation that a seal has been placed upon all the saints. Why is God saying that? God knows that if there is a saint that does not have the seal, they will be taken out when these four angels come. God wasn't saying that because it was a heavenly ritual or ceremony. He said that because that was the order that he had put in place from time immemorial. All right? You can read about these things from Revelation chapter four, five, and six. He said, let there be a seal, confirmation on every saint before they release the angels. But guess what? We are also told that there is a time set for the angels to be released. So what that means is God is playing his part in making sure that you look distinct enough. It is now left to you to choose to abide under the seal or to break ranks. Laura, what is the seal upon the saints? The Bible says the Holy Spirit is our seal unto the day of the Lord Jesus. You need to be in the Holy Spirit. You need to be enveloped in the presence of God so that when these angels come and they see you from a distance, you are shining. The Bible says when Daniel was speaking concerning the great day of the Lord in Daniel chapter 12, he said, after heaven had beheld the earth and there was tribulation on the earth such as have never been seen, then the archangel of the, the archangel Michael, the angel of the princes of God's people, arose and he spoke and he says, come up. He said, and immediately within the twinkle of an eye, the saints became what? He says, those who turn many to righteousness 
They became what? They became as the stars of the heavens. They became luminous, distinct, unmistakable. So what am I saying, folks? God is doing his part of making the distinction between us and the world, but it is now left to you and I to choose whether we will be stiff-necked or if we will respond to him. Four things, very quickly, examples of how people have remained stiff-necked and how they may miss out on the divine protection that God has. Thing number one is many of us are fi we're finding, finding it difficult to stop looking at the things of the world. We still have our eyes set on achieving goals in the world more than, we're, more than we're interested in achieving strides with the Holy Spirit. Many of us spend more time watching the news so that we can know where to move our stock to. Oh, I need to move this stock from here. I need to put it there. If I don't watch the news and I don't know what is going on, I may miss out on the stock. But where did Satan get that idea from? Where did Mammon get that idea from? Because God expects you to focus on him and the news of heaven so you know where to put your heart. But many of us, we just can't stop following the world because we are so materialistic. And the Bible says all these things are vanity and they're about all to be destroyed in the fire. Why don't you protect the one thing that will make it to the other side? Your soul. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? The other reason why many of us have become stiff-necked is because we are so accustomed to looking at ourselves and looking to ourselves and to our hands for help that we don't know how to look up to God. David says, I will lift up my head to the hills from whence come my help. But we keep looking because they told us to pull ourselves up by our bootstrap and we have become so accustomed to seeing ourselves as the ones that will get it done. We need to learn how to surrender. Even Jesus on the cross lifted up his eyes and he says into your hand, I commit my spirit. The same word of God that upholds all things knew when to surrender. Thing number three that is keeping many of us stiff naked, but we're not moving, we're not turning, is because of the fact that we don't want anybody to see that we even admit that there's need for repentance. We have given the people around us the impression that we are deputy Holy Spirits. And God is telling you that certain things that you're doing, you can do better. Certain things that you are doing that are right, you can be more consistent at, but you don't want to admit it. And so you don't want to turn around, it's like, I don't want nobody to see me, I'm just gonna stay here. It is called stiff nakedness. Allow other people to hold you accountable and say, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling in this area, I need to get better. What do you do? Can we pray together? You see what I mean? And thing number four, let me actually read that one to you, is in Matthew chapter four. I'm gonna read that to you, Matthew chapter five. Sorry, I'm gonna read that to you very quickly, Matthew chapter five, verse 44, I believe. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I want you to see uh, Matthew chapter five, verse 44. Look at what it says. He says that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. The reason why many of us are stiff naked is because we want to be the judge of all things. And God is telling you, look away. But no, you don't want to. You want to focus on other people's sins. You want to focus on their shortcomings. And God is saying, I am the one who makes it rain upon the good and the wicked. I am the one who is the judge. What is you, I mean, what is it to you if I decide to be merciful on the guiltless? You look away. But many of us, we don't want to look away. We're so hell bound on seeing people punished in a certain way. We're so hell bound on seeing people walk into the trap that they have set. No, it is none of your business. Look away and let the mercy of God prevail. I just said I'll give you four examples of how people have remained stiff naked in these last days. There are so many more, but let the Holy Spirit reveal to you what you need to do to be flexible enough to rise with the mercy of God that has come to pick you up. Because the fact that God is making a distinction doesn't mean that it is automatic. You have a part to play. You need to be responsive. So I want to encourage us as we break bread today to look into the perfect law of liberty. And to also open ourselves up for that law of liberty to look into us. David looked into the mercy of God and he says, Lord, search me. I have searched for you 
I have found you. Now I want you to search me and see if there's any wicked way in me. I have you in me, but I also want to be in you. I have searched for you and I want you now to search me. Let us be ready to present ourselves before the Lord and let him examine our hearts and show us where we have gone wrong so that we can align ourselves to remain under the seal of the Holy Spirit in these final hours. The Lord wants you to maintain your place in Him. Stay in righteousness, stay at peace, and remain joyful. See, every other thing that you're chasing after is immaterial. All of the limitations that we have in the human body, that we have in the flesh, are about to be done away with because we are set to receive our new bodies shortly. And so if I am going to receive my new body shortly, if I am going to receive the inheritance that he has promised me, he said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 5, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth, the whole earth. Then why should I keep focusing on chasing shadows and seeking after what the Gentiles are running after? I'm about to have it all. Why do I want to blow it away? As I want to encourage you, choose Jesus today. Choose to seek the Holy Spirit today. Choose to spend enough time in his presence until you have received everything that he has for you in this season. And if you already have the bread and the wine, I would like for you to take it prayerfully today. Jesus says, as often as, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. He says, this bread is my body that was broken for you. This blood is, this wine is my blood, the blood of the new and the everlasting covenant that was shed for you. We do this in remembrance of you, Jesus, as we supernaturally and authoritatively call to remembrance the forces that govern life, that they may be fully reminded that the life that we now live, the lives that we live, each of us, we live the glorified life of the Son of God. And so if there's anything in my life that doesn't seem to conform to the glory, I renounce it and I call my mind, my thoughts, my actions to remembrance that it was for me that he died, that my life may give him glory. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. I want us to spend the next couple of minutes just praying. Is anybody coming forth for a testimony real quick before we continue praying? Or did we take them all? Praise God. So today I would like for each and every one of us to rise up if we can, wherever we're at. And I want us to pray. And the prayer that we're saying today is the prayer of thanksgiving mixed with supplication. And the way we're going to mix our thanksgiving with supplication today is to thank God for the things that we had tried to do that we couldn't, but that God has done for us. Supplication is a humble prayer. So thank God for those things that you tried to do, that you couldn't do, but God has done for you. You know what those things are. Every one of us, we have one of two things that we once strived to accomplish that didn't work, but God made it possible, especially when you least expect. And these are not the times to pray under your breath, these are the times to lift up your voices as though you want it to be heard on high. And just give God thanks. And just make a joyful noise before the Lord. And just sing a song in your heart to the Lord. And say, Jesus, I thank you. Because I couldn't have held on by myself, but you held me. Even when I was ready to let go, you didn't let me go. You sustained me. And I am giving you thanks because I stand because you are here. In the mighty name of Jesus. And as we are blessing God, he is releasing more. He is releasing more over us. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. 
God is good. I was going to go and pray for folks and the Holy Spirit said to me that as many people as need healing in their bodies to come right here. If you need healing in your bodies, please come right here. And if you need healing for your mind, if you know the enemy has been messing with your mind lately, I want you to do actually come up here. I want to pray for the three or four people who need a restoration in their mind of the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Healing for your body, stay right here and we'll get to you. Josephine, you stay here, but you're not the first person that I saw. So if you know that lately your joy has been messed with, you can't even just get to that place of joy and stay there. It's an attack of the enemy. I want to pray for you. No, I want you to come up here. Oh, yes. This is for people with physical healings. And I just want you to, to be blessing God wherever you're at. Because we have something that the world is seeking. We have the presence of God. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. What does that mean? Sister Michelle, can you come over here, please, ma'am? Today, we will pray. I want you to stay right here. Brother Jackson, I want to pray for you. I want you to come right here. I know that as soon as I declared that peace of God upon you, I saw you, you received it. But the Lord has more for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I want you to say, I believe. Help my unbelief. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, any strongholds, any limitations in the thought realm that may want to get in the way of the abundance that you have for your son in this season, let it be loose right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Let such strongholds be loosened, be blown away by the wind of your divine judgment that your son may have a full gateway that is open to receive the fullness. What God has for you in this season is maturity in faith. What God has for you in this season is stability in your thoughts. What God has for you in this season is the resilience to stand and to be able to lift others up in the mighty name of Jesus. Let this mind be in you, the Lord says, which was also in Christ Jesus. He has not given to you the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love, of power, and of a sound mind. You're about to step into a season wherein you will no longer remember the last time your heart skipped a beat. Regardless of what you hear, you're not gonna feel anything in your heart simply because he's wrapping your heart in his love. You will respond to his love and that's it, not anything else. No bad news. No fearful thoughts. Just his love. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. Because by it, the Lord is going to place you in a garden wherein you don't have to reach out too far to receive the fruit that you need for the nourishing of your spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, God bless you. Michelle, thank God because I remember my wife said to me that you said that the storm is over. Right? Was that what Michelle said? That you were dealing with certain things? Since January 1st. Since January 1st, but things have calmed down. So we're going to pray over you today that affliction will not arise. You see, because the ones who are responsible for attempting to rob you of your peace, they've been startled, but they have not given up. But we will put them at bay. The Bible says they will come in one way, but they will flee in seven ways. So right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray over you, woman of God, that you will see yourself as the Lord sees you, in the mighty name of Jesus. Your heart will receive a consciousness of who you are in Christ Jesus. You see, when you have a dream that seems unpleasant and you wake, you will not be troubled. You will roll over and you will sleep again because you will know the difference between the enemy's illusions targeted at robbing you of your peace and the real trouble. Even when there is a real trouble, you still will not be troubled because you are confident in the Lord. But going forward, you will sleep, your sleep will be sweet and sound. Your heart is immune to the fiery darts of the enemy. They are cowards, they stand from far away and they keep sending you things to trouble you, but they do not know that you are under the shadow of the Almighty God. So right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for you to receive new dreams fresh insight and fresh revelations that your heart might be at peace always in Jesus name. Josephine, I want you to say this. I will speak to the storm. Peace be still. In the mighty name of Jesus, the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus is upon your lips. You don't have to think it. 
You don't have to try to resolve it in your mind. You just have to speak the promises of God and you will be at peace in the mighty name of Jesus. So right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for everybody that is here today to experience the wind of the robe of God's presence. If you have never felt it before, I pray that you will feel it today. Where you're standing, you will feel the breeze of his robe because the Lord is here and he is moving amongst us through the ministry of his angels. And not only are you to imagine it, you are to experience it in the name of Jesus. There is one more person and I can hear you saying, oh, I think I should have gone up there. If that is you, come now. I want to pray for you. It's in your mind. Oh yes, praise the Lord. God is good. Yeah, so you kind of hesitated a little bit because you're like, yeah, some of the things that I was saying was resonating with you. And it's like, okay, this is how I'm going to deal with it. But the Lord still wanted you to come here today. Alrighty. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, you are God's battle axe. You are his instrument of war. And that is the reason why he's been dealing with you the way he has. You see those moments that you feel like maybe the Lord is a little rough with you. He is sharpening you. You've even given yourself examples of people who had it a little easier than you or times that even you had it a little easier. You're like, why now? And the Lord is saying, because I'm getting you ready. You see that knowledge and that revelation will bring you peace. Yes, it will bring you the peace that is beyond understanding because right now you're standing before the Lord and your spirit is saying, Lord, <laughs> you will not give me more than I can handle. So sharpen me as much as you need. It is all for your glory. You see, you're about to be effective in prayer like you have never been. You're about to be effective in witnessing like you have never been. Because the Lord has dealt so wonderfully with you in the mighty name of Jesus. And so, Lord, I thank you because of the atmosphere of her mind that has been made subject to this training exercise. Lord, nothing will be amiss. There will be order. There will be peace. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord restores you in glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. Be at peace, woman of God. Be at peace. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you. God will give you praise. Oh, Father, I thank you for this woman. Not just your physical ear, but your spiritual ear will be opened. I want you to come here because I am told that my microphone needs to kind of like be within this region. And so once I'm done praying for you, please make room for others in this region. So I'm not done praying for you. As I was coming toward you, one of the things that I saw was I saw your ears being opened. And the Lord said to me, it's not just the physical ear, but your spiritual ear will open. A lot of what you've been doing in the realm of the spirit from what was shown to me is you've been reading signs you haven't really heard. And you've gotten good at it. In fact, there are times where you've convinced yourself that God spoke to you, but in reality, you were just reading signs because that ear is yet to pop, but it pops right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want you to say, I receive hearing. I receive hearing. You see, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. Hearing itself is a privilege. You have to be able to hear because if you do not hear, faith cannot come in because faith has to come in. And what brings that hearing is the word of God. And so Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, there is one word, you know, like the, like the little girl that Jesus said to a father, which means be open. It is that one word. And the Lord says, he loves you. Love is that word. That is the word that will open up your ear. He loves you. Through it all, he's never stopped loving you. He loves you more than you have seen and is inviting you to come closer. Now in the mighty name of Jesus, hear it. Hear the love of the Father in your ear and faith will follow. And so Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, as a sign to this woman I ask today, be merciful, Lord. Unto her, let her body reflect what has happened in the realm of the Spirit. In the name of Jesus. I commit this woman to the ministry of the angels of God who are ministering spirits unto you and I as heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. Where's my leader? Come. God bless you. As I was praying for her, I heard that it is now time. You have waited 
you have been patient, you have persevered. In fact, in some cases, it appears as if you have been stubborn. And that's just because you've said in your heart that I will not let you go until you bless me. And I heard it in my ear today. The Lord says, it is time. In the mighty name of Jesus, it is time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It is time. It is time. It is time. It is time. My sister Z, I want you to come forward. You see, what you have received of the Lord is already done. However, what I see is that you need to continue to enforce it with your mouth. You need to keep speaking it. And so Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I release upon this woman today by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, the unction to speak your will without wavering. You will keep confessing until you have possessed that which the Lord promised in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Brother Ricky, the Lord said to me that they don't need to know. But once it's done, can you come closer? I want to pray for you. The Lord showed me something that you're dealing with that others do not know about. You've kept it to yourself. You've kept it fairly well. And the Lord says that when it happens, that which the Lord will do concerning the matter, then it will be time for others to know. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let it be made complete in this realm the testimony that's already been written. I see the testimony written, sealed, and rolled up and given to the angel of the Lord to bring to you. You see, that testimony is already complete in heaven. There is nothing that will stop it from being complete here on the earth. And others will gather around the table. You will be seated. I see you sitting down as one cutting a birthday cake. As you sit down to cut the cake, the song they sang instead of happy birthday was it is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our sight. The Lord has done it, and you will see it, and they will see it too. So, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord blesses the honor of your heart. You have honored the Lord with your perseverance and your long suffering. When other people were going around looking for help where there is no help, you decided to call only upon the name of God. And He has come through for you as He's done again. He says, I have done this before, and you know it. He said, This time around, I am doing it again, but the light of it will shine even brighter. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. Brother John, thank God for your faith and thank God for your confidence in God. I pray for you today, myself and everybody that is here present in the name of God will lift you up to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that the desire of your heart before the Lord be granted that once again you will rise up and dance before the Lord. You have chosen to dance once again before the Lord. Your desire is not to walk around and do the things that you normally do just, but your desire is to stand again to praise the God of heaven, to bless his name and to thank him for his goodness. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, let this man receive the blessing of gratitude. As he has remained grateful to you, Father, we thank you. The Lord says we need to all thank him for this man. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Brother John, when you were taken to the hospital, before John left town, he said, I am leaving, but I need you to pray. And we prayed, and the Lord revealed that which was hidden from men. And you're standing here already a miracle. The prayer that we say over you today is that there will be multiplication. You have already received a healing miracle and there will be a multiplication of that healing miracle. Your body is not a stranger to healing. So in the mighty name of Jesus, I command that strength comes to your bones. In the mighty name of Jesus, that life comes to your bones. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you because you will visit this man as you have revealed to me. The Lord will visit you. He said from here onwards, songs of praises are your thing. The Lord is saying what you do from here is you sing songs of praises and it will, it will visit you. The Lord will visit you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because the way we have rejoiced with Brother John, we will rejoice with him again. And I have a word for you in addition to the Lord saying that it will visit you. 
you will dance again. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will dance again. Thank you for the faith in your heart to come in here today to the presence of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Give him praise. Lord, let the virtue flow. Let it flow in the mighty name of Jesus. Let that healing unction, Lord, that is present in here, let it distill over your son, even by the oil of the anointing. I want somebody to get me the oil. I'm going to pray for you with the oil of the anointing. In the meantime, I'm going to pray for your wife. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. The Lord says, the way you resisted the reports of men, the same way your cells will now begin to resist any ailments, any infirmity. Your heart immediately said no to the report of men. And by that act of obedience and confidence in God, your entire body, every cell, every tissue, the light, the waves, the chemicals, everything in your body, even the sound that runs in your system, we yield to the word of God and say no to every negative feeling. We'll say no to every infirmity in the mighty name of Jesus. It doesn't matter what names they have given to it. We know the name that we have been given by God to resist the devil and it will flee from us. Let the resurrection power come over you now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord in Jesus name I thank you because the Lord is with you. The angels of the Lord are around you to bring to fulfillment that which the Lord has professed over you. You know, when I was praying just now, I saw you and what I saw was you rose up with your hands lifted up. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because, let me tell you this. Can you come closer, Bonita? I am praying for you today because that which you experience in your body is because of that which you have suffered in your mind. You will know joy again you will you see i'm talking about joy that actually allows for you to be happy all through the day to feel light-bodied all through the day father in the mighty name of jesus i want to tell you you see because the lord says you are where i want you to be you know there are times when you question am i supposed to be here am i supposed to be elsewhere the lord says i want you right here you are where you are supposed to be Question no more where you are and how you are. You see, the Lord is with you. Everyone who has left you has created a vacuum for the Lord to fill. Don't miss them. Receive what the Lord has for you. And when I say don't miss them, let it not come out of your mouth. Let it not be in your thoughts that if only this had been, if only this person was still here. No, the Lord is here. The Lord is here. Shake yourself from the downhill. Shake yourself from the disappointment. The Lord is here. The Lord is mightier than they are. In the mighty name of Jesus, nothing will be missing, nothing will be lacking. And this is not the time for you to go back to that box and open it to remind yourself of that which has been taken from you. Keep the box closed. You are not looking back, you're looking forward because God has great things for you in the mighty name of Jesus. And so you body, hear me. Hear me, the Lord has perfected all that concerns this woman. And you need to be a reflection of that. Because you are from the earth. Oh earth, hear the voice of the Lord. Your body will begin to respond. I literally saw hairs on your body standing, responding to the word of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, you already know that he that has begun a good work, is able to bring it to a perfect completion. You see, God has just given you a house and he knows everything else that has to go with it. So what do you have to do? Just give him thanks. Once a thought comes to your mind, before you think of how I'm going to get it, thank him because you will get it. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, did you also come out for healing in your body? All right, you want to tell me something? All right. That is what they said, but this is what I say by the unction of the Lord and in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every one of those things that they said are in your body that bring destruction are no longer in your body. At the word of the Lord, you will return and your diagnosis will change. 
What you're experiencing is a similar miracle to what was going on right here with John's grandmother. But I say to you in the mighty name of Jesus, when the time comes, the Lord will let you know you will go back there and you will receive a different diagnosis. I can see it. It's being replaced with what the Lord says. So don't even think about it. Don't worry about it. Don't let it raise your blood pressure. Don't let it give you any sleepless night. It's because the Lord is your peace. And no one can take that peace from you. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to do something. You see that your right leg. I want you to stomp that way. In the mighty name of Jesus. One more time. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. And you know what you're doing? What you're saying is, I put my foot down on that which the word of God has said. Your heart will not waver in Jesus' name. There is a lady that is standing here. I see you trying on different outfits. You try this on and you take it off. You try this on, you take it off. And the Lord is saying, let me dress you. In the areas of your life wherein you feel exposed and you have tried to find yourself a covering, the Lord says, let me dress you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this woman has been brought to the place of glory. You will be arraigned in glory. You see, this is going to happen on a daily basis. When you're talking to people, you won't have to say things to convince them of your ability. You won't have to do things to convince them of who you are. It will be seen because the Lord has put his emblem and his mark upon you. You see what I mean? So don't you ever feel that pressure anymore to say, no, I have to do this, I have to say that so that they know I know what I'm saying. No, when they see you, you will appear in the robe of righteousness and they will know that you are equipped and more than enough. Let him robe you and you will never have to feel exposed again in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. God is good. Nicole, physical healing. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. I want you to go back on that stage just for a moment and I'm going to come and pray for you. Just stay there because there was something about people who needs work to be done on their minds. And so just stay there for a minute. And I'm going to just have Rosemary take the oil with me. I need to go and anoint John. Or oh, is he left the room already? Oh, he's right there. Okay, all righty. I want you to get the oil and be ready for me. Anybody else apart from Alexis standing here for healing in their bodies? All righty. I'm going to pray for you with the oil as well. In fact, give me a dash of the oil just now. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Father, I thank you because of what you have shown to me concerning this woman. A couple of days ago, I lifted thee up in my prayers before the Lord. And I know that you have been seen. You have been seen by your heavenly physician. And your diagnosis is that it is well with you. Hallelujah. And so, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, for the faith of this woman and for her confidence in this gospel of peace, let this healing happen now. In this realm, in this physical dimension, let it be a replication of what you've already done in heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus, Hannah, receive God's healing grace over you and into you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to stretch forth both of your hands just slightly in front of you. Lord, everything that is in this body will respond to the word of God. Every tissue in this body will respond to the word of God and your healing will be made complete. The word of God says affliction will not arise a second time. The Lord's healing power has hit you once before. You testified and now the enemy wants to challenge your miracle. And we deny the enemy at the word of God that this affliction is done away with and all illusions surrounding this affliction we rebuke and we send back to oblivion in the mighty name of Jesus. Hannah, Jesus has healed you. You are healed and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We release over you the grace to testify shortly in the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Let this also result into all deliverances needed to happen in this life. That this one might walk free. 
free in the mighty name of Jesus. Alexis. Okay. Alrighty. So get on here too because you are here for the mind. Get on here too and I will pray for you shortly. Thank you Jesus. Brother John, the Lord has instructed me to anoint you. I'm just going to place some oil on your head. I hope that's okay. And this is um, the reason why I am anointing you. I know and the Lord says to me to share with you as well. Jesus says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. The Spirit of God came upon Jesus because Jesus bore the mark of the anointing. I anoint you for a divine visitation that will bring about the perfection of that good work that the Lord has begun. The Lord will visit you in your own space and it will perfect all that concerns you and you will rise and dance in the place where you will always dance. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, let there be an abounding by your grace. Lord, I'm going to do this. They may have to wipe your face once I'm done. But the Lord says to me, from the bottle to his head. And I'm just going to let the oil of the anointing go from the bottle to your head. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Because we have done as you have commanded. And Lord, as we are present here, we will be present and we will hear the testimony of the great deliverance that you have done in the life of this man. I commit you to the Lord and to the host of heaven to bring into perfect completion the good work that the Lord has begun. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Ricky, can I pray for you real quick? Yes, ma'am. Oh, absolutely. I will anoint you also because the Bible says desire the best gifts and as you have desired to have this same visitation, you will receive a visitation and his testimony will not just be his to share, but you will also be a partaker of this divine visitation in the mighty name of Jesus. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The Lord said to me, say it to her because it's going deep into your spirit. And when it echoes back to your thoughts, no falsehood will stand. Nothing but the truth of God's word concerning you, that you are in health. You see, when I was praying for Carnita, the Lord said to me that her miracle is like your miracle. A change in diagnosis because the Lord has visited you. And when the time comes, you will go in and you will come out and you will have a different report. You have come here, further away from here than anybody else in this place. And the Bible says that God is not unrighteous to forget our labor of love. The Bible says in much labor there is profit. And you have labored the day to press into the presence of God. You will have something to show for it in due time. Believe in the Lord and it shall be well with you, you and your household in Jesus name. And Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for you that as you will receive this healing in your bodies, you would also receive divine prosperity. You see, because they go together. When the Lord says that you prosper and be in health as your soul prospers, if there is anything that you desire to accomplish that seems to be an uphill battle, the Lord says now it has been made low, you will just walk through it. Before you, there is an open door. That which seems to be this high, the Lord says, I am bringing it low. The Lord will send you a man that will help to reduce that which appears to be a mountain before you. There is a mountain before you and the Lord says, a man will come in and he will bring it down. The Lord says before you, there is an open door. You see what I mean? I don't know what it is, but the Lord says he will bring it down. Whatever it is. Father, I thank you. I know what it is. It's got to do with prosperity. And the Lord says, I will bring it down. I will bring it down. You see, it doesn't matter what anybody has written down on paper. The Bible says every handwriting of the ordinances that are against you shall be blotted out. It will be brought low in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, you have sought the Lord and you have found him. Now wait until you start unraveling the presence that he has given to you today. God bless you. I want to pray for you real quick. I see you praying for a young woman that is demon possessed. And the Lord says, you just need to speak a word and there will be great deliverance. 
they will come to you later and say what did you tell her something's changed and what's changed is that she's going to be restored is a young girl little girl not much taller than your elbow she comes in wearing denim she's wearing denim she's she's got white and pink on and she comes to you her head is not covered but her hair is put together i see her standing next to you and you say one word and the spirit that troubles her leaves the room Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because so shall it be. In the mighty, in the mighty name of Jesus, let me tell you something. It's going to happen very soon. I smell paint like fresh paint. It's going to happen very soon. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Let's just give God praise. Alexis, I'm going to pray for you, but let me pray for this woman. Lord, in Jesus' name, the Lord would have me say to you that it's time to let go of the past. Certain things that you have become accustomed to subconsciously, you expect them to happen again and they result in the agitation of your mind. They cause you anxiety. Don't worry, they will not happen again. You're not where you used to be. God has brought you from that place. You are not returning to Egypt. You understand what I mean? These people of today are not the people of yesterday. This person of today is not the person of yesterday. What they've done to you is because of who they are. It's not of because of who you are. You're not the one attracting disappointment. You're not the one attracting unbelief. You have struggled with people even believing that which you say. But don't worry. The ones around you today and the one with you will believe the word of God that is in your mouth. Let every anxiety bow to the assurance of the word of God in the life of this woman. In the mighty name of Jesus. You know what I want you to do? This man comes here to be a blessing to us. But as soon as I laid my hands on you, the Lord said to me, tell them to bless him. And when you bless him, you're tapping more into the fullness of God's presence. It doesn't matter what it is. Just let the Lord lead you. Just bless this man. He doesn't even know. He's probably wondering what I'm doing. But let's see what the Lord has for you. Bless him. Alexis, the Lord said to me, you have written certain things down and you're letting those things be sort of like a burden on you. Almost as if you need to live up to that expectation. Oh, I need to do this. I need to fulfill this thing. I've already told myself this is the way it's going to go. And the Lord says, if you would be willing to do away with that and to let go, let me show you a new way. You see, some God has something new for you. New things. God has his own list of how he wants to use you, what he wants you to do, where he wants you to go how he wants you to be, the people that he wants you to be with. You see, but staying rigid and staying committed to that in the name of not giving up on your dreams is not allowing you to embrace what he has for you. So just let go of the list and see what God has for you. He will reveal himself to you mighty and strong. The Lord says that he wants you to engage the righteousness of Daniel. When he told me that, what it meant for me was I needed to study Daniel and it completely changed my world. And so I want to encourage you, study the life of Daniel. Get close to that man of God and see what things he received from God that needs to be seen in your life. It begins with consistency in the place of prayer, wherein you have your set time in the place of prayer and build the confidence such that no matter what anybody is saying, you will not be afraid of, what, of their threats. You know what I mean? You will not be afraid of your threats. You've been threatened once before. You see what I mean? When you were much younger as a teenage girl, you were threatened. And since then, you've been afraid of threats. You always want to give in. In fact, you don't even want the threat to come. And the Lord is saying that you are a Daniel. You are never afraid of their threats. They may threaten you with the lion's den, but you will not be afraid because the Lord has provisions to, to keep you there and to bring you out alive. They can threaten you with all kinds of things, but your confidence in God will rise. I see that at the age of 14, that was when one of those incidents happened to you. You were threatened, fear came in, and since then it's been keeping you away from being as confident in pursuing the Lord and receiving what he has for you. The Lord who is the same yesterday, today, and forever is able to go back in time because it's the Lord of eternity to fix the past and is fixing that for you today so that from today you begin to see the glory revealed that the Lord has for you. Anything that you have left behind, the one that restores the years to the, of, that the locust and the canker worm have eaten is restoring to you, is restoring your confidence, restoring your creativity, is restoring to you good memories of places that you should have gone to that you did not even go. I want you to hear me. The Lord says he is restoring to you memories of places that you should have gone that you did not go. 
So you didn't even go, you didn't have those experiences, but the Lord will give you the joy of the memory because that is part of your restoration package today in Jesus' name. God bless you. Tear the list to receive his one in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Mikai, I heard a good report about you recently of the desire in your heart to be closer to God. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus that you will receive the heart of understanding. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. Are you his sheep? Are you in his following? Will you obey wherever he leads? Mikai, you know about Jesus and how he came as an example of how we all need to live in obedience to the Father. And he demonstrated it even by going to the cross to lay down his life to pay for our sins, to forgive us so that we can also forgive other people. The forgiveness that God has for you works in such a way that you have to forgive others and then you will receive the fullness of his forgiveness. It doesn't matter what anybody has done to you. Don't let that grief keep you from his joy. You see what I mean? Anyone that you have not released from your heart will remain between you and God and you want to be close to God. So you need to let them go. Forgive them for they do not know what they do. If only they know how much your Heavenly Father loves you, they will love you too. If only they know how much your Heavenly Father cares about you, they will care about you. If they know what God has for you, they would want to be in your life. They would want to celebrate you. They would want to, they would want to be in your good books because you're a great man before your Heavenly Father. But because they do not know, they do it to their loss. But you should not let their loss become your loss too. Let them go. Say to the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you are my savior. I embrace your love. I embrace your forgiveness. And I am going to love them as you love me. And I know you love me, so I have to love them. And your love for me will make it possible for me to love them. Because this is in my quest to get close to you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Compassion is going to come upon your heart. It's coming into you right now. The Lord's compassion is coming into you right now so that you, even you, can be compassionate upon the ones who have done wickedly. Because now you realize that, oh, they were not being wicked, they were just being ignorant. And then you will feel, not just feel sorry for them, but you will have compassion upon them. Let the love of God flow from you in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare over you today healing. Your heart has been healed because you have not received the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. Look at me, Mikai. The Lord is giving you a new heart today. Don't let the enemy do to it what it's done to the old one. Love always, pray often, and engage the Lord at all times. When thoughts come to your mind and you have questions, ask the Lord. He speaks to you. And when you speak to him, you position yourself to hear him back. Yours is going to be a great prophetic experience in righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, Brother Greg, it has begun. Don't, don't, you don't even have to live where you're at. It has begun. The Lord showed to me an hourglass that was turned, and it has begun. So the countdown is already on. So you watch as the day goes by, one thing after the other. They're going to be getting fulfilled and checked off the list. In the mighty name of Jesus, it has begun. Literally, things are leaving. It has begun. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Big miss. Oh, yeah. Healing? All right. In the mind. Oh, yes. You want to see Jesus? Come up here. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. So this is what I'm going to do. The Bible says what you have is what you give. I have had the privilege of having divine encounters with the Lord. I have walked into my room after one of the meetings here in recent times and the messenger of God was waiting for me in the room. The best way I can describe him is he dressed like someone from maybe like 2,000 years ago. He literally dressed like a priest with ephod around him. He was waiting for me in the room. And as I walked in, we finished the meeting here. We had fellowship and all of that. 
And as soon as I got home, he was waiting for me. I opened the door of the room to go and sleep. But I knew that there was something going on. I felt a presence around me in the house. I jumped from the living room and I went upstairs quickly. And as soon as I opened the door of the room, he said to me, as he was leaving, he said to me, we're coming for you tonight to show you what you've asked for. He was, he was literally leaving. I barely caught a glimpse of him. He left and that night they came for me. And they took me to a place that I have no recollection of ever being. A different world. And they showed me that which my heart had desired to see. And I shared the story with you. My heart had desired, even though the Lord, I asked the Lord to show me what the earth really looks like. He took me a couple of years ago and he showed it to me. And I said, okay, but I hear that there, is more, there are more places, even in scriptures. The Bible talks about the upper chambers of God. The Bible talks about the fact that God has sheep in other fold. And I'm like, Lord, what do those other places look like? And that night they took me and showed to me those other places. And so the same way that the Lord has given me such divine encounters, the Lord will give you divine encounters. I release upon you today by the grace of God, that which I have also received, not by works, not by self-righteousness, but purely by grace and the mercy of God, divine encounters, you will see the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. Let every impediment, every shadow that has clogged your vision up until now, let them be removed from you. Let every scale in your eye drop. I keep hearing your spirit saying, I just want to see the Lord. You will see the Lord, Kenyatta. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will see the Lord. I commit you to the angel of the scrolls. They will show you greater mighty things which you do not know. Praise the Lord. God is good. Ah, you, you're already seeing. Ah, no, 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 no. <laughs> you will see more. <laughs> you will see more. Come and see me this week. I have something for you. Come and see me. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty. I think this is probably lo the longest we have been here in recent times. But we thank God because I believe that um, even though it's not an all night meeting, it's pretty close to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Are you still here? Don't be just here. Move forward. And what I mean by that is, I'm not talking about this physical place. So I want you to take a step of faith and just move from where you're at. You see, the Lord has positioned you here, but a part of you is still there. And the Lord is saying, move forward. So I want you to rise up and come forward in the mighty name of Jesus. Now stay where you're at, okay? If I move back just a little bit, I want you to stand where I see you standing, right there. No, 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 that step is too backwards, right there. Move that feet forward a little bit. Praise the Lord. You see, that was exactly where I saw you standing. And the Lord says that they need to hear you as though you have already taken possession. When you speak to them, they want to hear confidence in your voice to follow you, to follow your leading. You see, the ones who have resources, those ones you told me about, the Lord says they will put it wherever you point, but they want to hear confidence in your voice. So you can only, you can no longer sound like a person with a plan. You need to sound like a person with a possession. They've heard the plan and now they want to see the confidence of a possessor. And by so doing, you will possess and you will keep possessing in the mighty name of Jesus. And so tell your brother when you see him, tell him to come here. He doesn't have to, you don't have to break it down to him. Just tell him to come here. By declaring to him to come here, he will start to come into agreement with you as a possessor, not just a planner. God bless you, in Jesus' name. Amen, praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty, God bless you. Thanks for your patience, Alan. Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on, somebody. Ah, yeah, that did it for him. I care, I see. Bless up, yeah, full see, I die. Hallelujah. 
Joshua, if you would, just help us with the offering slide real quick. I ain't going to hold this. Uh, as I've said before, you don't want to miss these meetings. You just, you just never know. You got to be here. Hallelujah. The offering slide is up. Um, you know, I just thank God for his mercy and how he showed up in this place. Let's, hallelujah, let us uh, give in our worship. We'll see the giving details here um, to our family online. We have several ways to give, Cash App, Communion House, our PayPal at Communion House, as well as Zelle. Uh, we'll see the number on the slide there. And I just want to give us an opportunity to just press into what the Lord has done here and the seed that he has given us. So let's ensure that we go forth in that. The scripture declares, as the man of God shared with us, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Father, we give you praise. There's none like you, O oh God. Truly, you have met with us tonight. You have found pleasure in us, for we know that you have created us, O oh God, for your own pleasure. And for Lord, we thank you that you have seen fit for us to be a part of your will here in the earth, O oh God, on the right side of the word, on the right side of prophecy, O oh God, doing kingdom business. Father, we ask of thee, look upon these offerings, these tithes, O oh God, the tenth part of what you have given us, and let it be sweet smelling. Lord, be glorified in us through our giving. We declare that all glory belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Family, you know we'll be back Tuesday. Other than that, I want y'all to have a blessed night. Take this home with you. Y'all be blessed.